All right. Okay, see everybody's joining us. We're just uh, working through some final technical snags here, everyone. So just bear with us for a sec. Um, okay. Aaron, are you able to speak? Can we hear you? We are not hearing you if you're speaking. How about you, Christine? Are you able to speak? So Hello? You yes. All right. Can you figure out how to get Aaron and Dave in here? I will do that right now. I'm going on mute and I'll have them on in just a second. All right. Well, while we're waiting here, it's uh, eight o'clock in the morning here in San Francisco. And uh, looks like we have a really a ton of interest in this topic. So thank you all for for joining us. As I mentioned, this is a new platform for us, so we're we're still getting used to it here. Um, and so hopefully, in just a moment, we will uh, we will have Aaron and Dave in here. Meanwhile, hey Roger in Sweden, thank you for joining us, Nicolas Olu. Yeah, we got uh, we got Toronto here, Louisville. Sweden, India, who else we got? Another Sweden, Brazil, Argentina. Hopefully someone from my home country of uh, Chile will show up. Chicago, UK, France. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll tee up the topic of what we're gonna talk about here and hopefully um, stall just long enough for us to uh, get the, our, the people you really wanna hear from, Aaron and Dave uh, on the call here. Um, so, so at Appistec University, you know, we've, we've been doing our, our courses. Um, we've got almost 80,000 of you have registered for, for Appistec U and, and all of our different courses. We also do these webinars. Uh, so hopefully we'll, we'll be able to get this one kicked off here momentarily. Hopefully you've all heard about Appistec Con that is running in today's May 2nd. So 20 days from now. On May 22nd, we're going to host AppySec Con. Hey, it looks like there comes uh, Dave. Yeah. Um, hey, Dave, how are you, buddy? Good. We're here. Um, Christine, looks like you've added Jan, maybe accidentally. Um, and there's Aaron. Hey, Aaron, how are you? Can you? Uh... I'm doing well. Hopefully, you can hear me. We can. All right. 802, not too bad, um, and, uh, and and we're live here. So let me just round out some of the the, the background uh, announcements here, and then we can dive right in here. And, and Christine, if you can pull up the slides that I sent you, or maybe I can, let's see if it actually works for me now. Let's see if I get lucky. Share. No, nah, doesn't seem to be working. So Christine, hopefully you can uh, you can pull up the slides. But uh, anyway, um, one last invitation, everybody, to come join us on May 22nd for AppySecCon. It's uh, it's our own API security conference. Uh, it's all free. It's all virtual. You can join from literally anywhere in the world. Um, free means uh, it's also um, vendor neutral. No sponsors, no expos, none of that. Um, you're not going to get harassed with uh, marketing emails or anything like that. Um, and we've got 25 really outstanding speakers lined up for the event. So go check it out. Um, it's, you can find the link on appysecuniversity.com and we'll share that link here later. But let's dive into the topic of today here, which is integrating API security into the dev lifecycle, right? And so I'm joined by two fantastic uh, uh, experts here. We've got Aaron Tesh from Accenture who's right out there on the front lines working with clients and, and tackling this whole concept of shifting left. And I've got my colleague, Dave Piscai, who runs the products team here at AppySec and AppySec University, who has also served on the front lines um, as an SRE and DevOps engineer and so forth. So Aaron, um, 
I'd love for you to just give a little bit of your background. And, and you know, I, when we did the prep call here, you were not short of opinions and ideas and thoughts on, on the topic of, of API security and shifting left. So uh, do you mind just giving us a little bit of your background? Yeah, sure. So um, just a little bit of background on me. So as you can tell by my, my gray hair, or at least what I have left of it, um, I have been around for a little while. So I've got... <laughs> But, oh, man, 26, 27 years, something like that of experience in the IT industry. Um, for the last uh, almost six years now, I've been in, in consulting. So that's been taking the things I've learned over my first 20 years where I was in um, in industry, as we call it, in the consulting side. So, you know, working for a big enterprise, doing uh, operations, security, software development, and all kinds of stuff over that time. Um, and of course, you know, things have changed a lot. And so as I was getting towards kind of the end of my enterprise career there in about 2018, the last several years were really focused on all of this new change that was coming in. And one of the big ones, of course, was we used to call it software oriented architecture, or SOA, and that turned into APIs, right? And so microservices yep. and nanoservices. So that, that had that transformation over time. So a lot of times when we talk about microservices or anything, we're, we're talking about APIs on the back end, right? Just small little things um, doing fit for, for purpose stuff. Um, so I had an opportunity in the enterprise to look at those types of um, uh, things like practical moving towards an enterprise security standard for the for the organization, as well as every app we developed internally had APIs in it. So as I had made my transition out of development into security, it became more and more important to understand, well, how do really APIs differ from, you know, maybe just kind of our standard front end applications or our large monolith applications. And, and to be honest, not not too different, like when you kind of get down to just the internal functions, but how they're deployed, how they're designed, you're starting to think about different things. Um, and so over the last six years here at Accenture, I'd say my, my role is I, I'm a DevSecOps capability lead. So how do I come into a client like, like yourselves and say, hey, here's where you are today. You have this goal of integrating uh, software security practices into your every day so that it always gets done. It's built in, it's on by default. Uh, so um, th that's kind of my day-to-day -day role is, is going into clients. Uh, I know I've had an opportunity to work a little bit with Dave and right some other folks in AppySec working with clients who have this um, need inside their enterprise to stop um, reacting to API security vulnerabilities. So a lot of tools do a great job of discovering what's happening to right. everything you've deployed. So, hey, here's this API, you deployed it. Did you know there's a vulnerability in it, right? Now we have a risk to our enterprise. And so, you know, what we're really looking to do is how do we get a little farther left? So as a developer, as you're writing code, maybe even running your application in your local environment or maybe in your development environment, we start to kind of integrate security in. So uh, that was probably a long yeah. introduction. Um, I'm pretty good at those. So uh, yeah, no, it's, it's <laughs> well, that's why we wanted you here, Aaron. Um, that kind of background is what what this this community is really itching to to learn from. Dave, um, you've got your own background here at Splunk and and elsewhere. You've sat in the the DevOps chair. Um, tell us a little bit about your background and and what interests you in this in this topic. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that I find interesting about my career and experience is I've had a few hard detours uh, and, and they kind of followed the way that the market reacted to different technologies and different capabilities. So it looked like in the beginning of my career, as I am chasing Aaron down with the years of experience that he brings, uh, it looked like I was going to be a web developer and continue to go down that path. And, and I took a hard cut over to the world of operations at the time. But then people were kind of saying, well, you're not all operations because you're still part dev. And they're like, wait, there's a word for that. I think we call it DevOps. Mm -hmm. And then again, it happened recently uh, when security started to get involved in this function as well. And so I've made sort of the journey from being a developer to being a developer blended ops, developer enablement, to SRE and sort of um, uh, production engineering, 
to product and, and now I have the pleasure of speaking to customers and learning about their problems and, and helping them orient and create solutions around API security, around API testing and all of uh, those great topics. And so really excited to join today, really excited to share some opinions and chat with Aaron and Dan. Uh, so thank you for joining. It's great to meet you all. Yeah, no, thank you for, for, for being with us here. And, and I'm hoping we're going to be able to get you to, to share your screen here successfully because I um, love to show the audience here what, uh, what is possible uh, nowadays. And so uh, let's just start at the basics. OK, like I, I'm not that technical, as, as you all know here. And so we hear this term shift left and integrating into the dev cycle. Um, yeah, thank you, Christine. We, we, ran this, we ran this survey. <clears throat> a lot of you probably participated in this. And we, one of the questions we asked was like, hey, where do you want to focus your, your security efforts, right? Shift left, shielding right, all this kind of thing. Um, it's not an either or, I get that, right? But the resounding uh, response was we want, we want to weave security into the dev pipeline. And, and Aaron, let's start with you. Like, what does that mean to you? And what do you think is behind this, this you know this wave of shifting left yeah so maybe to start first like i think what the biggest thing behind the wave for shifting left is the farther to the right we are the harder it is to make changes yeah. in the product life cycle um, even if you're running like agile and you've got a sprint every two weeks right and you're you you, you have a faster reaction mechanism than, than like a waterfall you're you're generally the way we test apis traditionally is let's deploy it let's go out grab some tools let's run some tests against it after the coding's been done and then we come back to the developers and tell them everything that they did wrong and now they have to figure out how to get all that code fixed and tested again before they're allowed to go into deployment so i think the big impetus right and the big desire to shift left is to say hey while i'm in the code can i react to the code or you know, is it possible to just start to move through the cycle? And so may maybe I'll describe just a little briefly what I think the options for going left are. So so let me I'll start on the right and say we have runtime, right? A runtime environment can be production, it can be integration environments, it can be non-production environments. To me, those are all right. You know, non-prod dev environments are kind of the far right of shifting left in my opinion. So, you know, if we're testing there, we're still really late in the cycle. So how do we start to move maybe a little farther to the left to say while we're developing? Um, and I know, Dave, we played around a little bit with this with AppySec is as a developer, I have the ability to test my application in my local runtime environment on my PC. Now, it doesn't exactly look like everything out there, but in terms of API security, Right. I can detect things like, you know, injection vulnerabilities and things like that. I may not have full, you know, authorization and access control things I can identify through there. But I'm able to start testing in my local development environment using something like an AppySec, uh, for example. Um, other places to go even farther left is as I'm writing code, how do I know that my block of code is an API? Well, in, in most uh, um, languages out there, there's a framework for API, something like Spring Boot or Python Flask, right? Or, you know, different um, uh, development languages. It's really easy to identify this is a route, this is the method on it, these are the properties that come into it. So we're able to use static analysis tool, and there are vendors out there in the market today that when they run a static analysis on code, they're not just identifying the vulnerabilities in the code or potential issues, they're identifying, hey, this is an API and it looks like you have a vulnerability in your API in the code. So we shift left to there. And then the next part to the left is, what are we doing in design? Are we really thinking about the requirements? You know, some of the things I always, you know, tell people, especially as we think about enterprise security is, are we behind an API gateway? Is it set up and configured properly to build in a bunch of these security features and capabilities like authentication, authorization, rate limiting, all of those things that get built into the platform. So, so we really need to think about what's happening in design on the left, uh, as far left as we can get in the design, what we're doing in the code, what we're doing local testing, and then development testing throughout. So, so we're really testing a lot of places, which is some people may think is a little bit redundant, 
However, it is those types of checks we run consistently that help keep us all honest. Well, I'm, I'm hearing here, Aaron, a, a theme of testing, right? Shift left in many ways equates to testing, right? Like it, it, it's sort of like uh, the doctor's visit, right? It's that preventative, proactive thing. There's a, there's a nice comment here from Nikolai. We've been shielding right for 40 years and it isn't working so, so well. High time to shift left. Um, <laughs> you know, it's interesting, like, the, you know, in, definitely in the API security market, you know, there are different camps or different viewpoints on how to do security. And in the runtime approach, right? Like when you look at all of these breaches that have taken place, right? And there are, we have, we have a whole market report. If you want to learn more about it, come, come talk to us. But there are dozens and dozens, right? My API breach Google alert seems to fire almost every single day, right? And, and I would say 99% of those, they were employing kind of the shield, right? web app firewalling and the gateways and so forth. And somehow these attacks are succeeding, right? And I think one of the main reasons is we're not talking about kind of your plain vanilla vulnerabilities here, right? Like a SQL injection or cross-site scripting, right? These are these are attacks that look like normal traffic, right? Like if you've if you've heard me ever present on like the Coinbase example, where the guy changed his his Ethereum to Bitcoin in an API call and it worked, right? There was no runtime tool that would have detected that, right? And said, right, this is a, this is a, um, you know, this is something unusual, right? The payload looked right, the data type looked right, everything looked right. They were just selling something that, that they didn't own, right? And so it just seems to me, Aaron, like, in runtime, you've got a split second, not even, you got a split millisecond to make a judgment on whether that's valid or not. Whereas in shift left, you've got all the context in the world, right? And it, and it feels like it's a, you know, I, I started my, my career at General Motors. I was a safety and crash engineer, right? I used to design airbags and smash up trucks and stuff. And they always beat in our head, like the earlier you can find a flaw, the cheaper, the easier, the more effective the fix is here. So is that, do you see a parallel here in, in this whole shift left concept? Yeah, in terms of the, it's cheaper to fix it the earlier you find it, absolutely. Well, not just cheaper, but also you have the the ability to to discover it and to do something about it, as opposed to in runtime when you've got that millisecond to make a judgment. Yeah, it, the, most certainly. And the other part about the, the runtime is the more the more controls we put in place in the runtime, the more we impact performance of our application too. So mm. they tend to say, hey, be really light on those things. Um, you know, we're also, you know, I, I would say a lot of times when we're doing those runtime checks, we're really just checking requests and responses. So we're looking at network layer seven and we're saying, does this request look right? And, you know, when it comes out, did it get an error, right? Does it look yeah. like I expected it to when it came out? And so during regular day-to-day -day use, you know, it, it kind of comes out the way the bad guy expected it to come out. You know, how do you check the response for an injection? I don't think you do. We're usually checking the requests. And so um, I think that that provides a lot of challenge there. So as we shift left, we're we're testing differently. We're looking at different parts of the application. We're looking at the code. We're looking mm -hmm. at the design specifications. Um, you know, there's other tools out there that will instrument directly into like your JRE. And so when it's executing, it will tell you during execution, hey, does this look wrong? So the IAST type capabilities mm -hmm. that are yeah. that are out there as well. Um, so a lot of it just depends on like making sure we have high quality test cases, um, you know, in the environment yeah. to make sure we're, we're kind of getting that thoroughness of testing. So, Well, and, and Dave, I want to bring you in here, right? So like, it feels to me like we've been shifting left a lot of things, right? Um, but maybe not so much on security. And I, I want to get you to weigh in here. Like we shift left, like we don't release code without doing functional testing, right? We don't release code without doing performance testing or unit testing or regression. Why is it such a novel idea to shift security left? Yeah, uh, it's an interesting question. I mean, one thing that you've seen in the market is 
developers are the most valuable resource to any company. And so over the past few years, many years, the, the companies have been protecting developer time and outsourcing other functions to other teams. And what has resulted is developers are laser focused on creating innovation and they're sometimes not accountable for all of the other surrounding and supporting factors that also contribute. And so security would handle all of securing the code after the developer's written it. Well, that the context sharing in that situation is really difficult. Imagine if you're trying to find something in a house, but it's not your house and the lights are off. Like that's what security is trying to do when they go and explore an application. They don't have all of the information to write high quality security tests for it. That's better suited for somebody who does know the application inside and out, knows the business logic of the application, can make it secure by design from inception when the ideas are started, when the business logic is being designed. And so I, I think to answer your question, that's why it's happened and, and companies are realizing that, man, these developers, uh, at, at Google even, we would call developers the best kind of developers, T-shaped, like a T. So not a specialist in one area, super, super deep, but broad enough across many different disciplines, security, deployment, production engineering, development, and software. And then they have specialties that they add on to that skill set. They go deep. That's the leg, the downward part of the T. They become experts in one area. So that type of an engineer, full stack engineers, full stack security em embedded engineers, like these types of engineers are the most valuable nowadays because the results are just massive, massively better when you are the owner of all information and the creator of also security and also production deployment and, and all of these other areas too. Well, it's interesting, you know, we do a lot of workshops uh, for organizations, for communities, and when we talk about API security and what's happening and how are these breaches happening and all this kind of thing. And, and, and then we coach folks on what kinds of things. And one of our best practices that we we constantly talk about is the need to to raise awareness not just with security teams but in the people the organizations that create and build our apis I, i've done these workshops where at the end of them i've had engineers say dan i already know some code i gotta go fix right and so you know we don't i don't feel like we need engineers to become security experts right there's some some pretty basic things that that can significantly improve and elevate. I mean, there's some, I mean, we see, you know, unlocked APIs all the time, right? Like there's no reason they should be unsecured, right? Or authorization logic flaws that allow, you know, Aaron to access Dave's records or things like that. And these are easily addressed. Or I say easily, I'm not a coder, but you know, they can, you know, they, they, they belong to be addressed in, in the dev cycle. Um, I want to, I want to uh, grab some of these good questions that are coming in already. So from Tim, as a BA, I'm not sure what BA stands for. Um, it would seem to me that it would also include design from a business logic and process and, and build and testing follow and integrate with that. Uh, I think, you know, I, I think this is a really interesting comment about business logic, right? And, and Dave, I'll, I'll, I'll flip that to you. Maybe Aaron, you've got some thoughts here, right? Like when we're, when we're looking at these API breaches, as I said, it's not so much like your plain vanilla, you know, CVE kind of thing. It tends to be your unique flaws, your logic gaps, your, your you know, things that are not a common vulnerability. They're a unique vulnerability. So how can folks, you know, um, address those types of concerns? Yeah, and I think it starts early on in the dev cycle where uh, it was um, Tim, Tim Williams. So you're you're the one who asked this question. Like when you're thinking about an application, Dan, Dan uses this phrase sometimes, and you might have to help me with it. It's not just checking that the good things happen when you do good things to the app. It's like what doesn't happen, you know, or what shouldn't happen when you do other yeah. things to the app. I, I don't know exactly how you phrase it. Do you, do no, I'll, I'll pull up the slide. Um, it, it has to do with thinking about validation and testing in, in a different way, kind of like stretching the box by which you would limit the inputs or the outputs, because uh, certainly as, as a 
you use the Coinbase example all the time. So like as a, as a cryptocurrency company, it is natural to think that somebody's going to want to exchange dollars for cryptocurrency and you know that should work. It's probably also natural if you step back and think about it that people are going to want to swap out those currencies and see what else they can exchange and what else the application will allow. And so not just the happy path of testing, which you know often unit tests I would consider to be sometimes a happy path. You can include negative cases in there, yeah. but it, additionally, taking a look at that and saying, man, if, if I were somebody who was, and this is why red teams exist, like uh, if I were to attack this, where would I, even with knowledge of the application as it sits, as I built it, where would I start? And, and where do I think the weak points are? So I, I think yeah. it's a mentality shift uh, in a way. And, and this is what you were talking about here, Dave, right? This is a this is a survey from Rapid API uh, when they, they asked folks, what, what are you what kind of testing are you doing on your APIs? Right. And and I kind of you know interpreted it here. Right. Those, those top three or four, which add up to 90 percent or something. Does it do what it's supposed to do? Right. And in the case of Coinbase. Right. Can I sell crypto that I that I own? Yes. Great. Let's ship it. Um, but way down there at 4% is the security testing. And I think that tends to be kind of the negative or the unhappy path, right? Which is, can I sell crypto that I don't own, right? So Aaron, is that, you know, there was a question here about, um, about testing. I think David here, do we need an automatic tool to check security issues in our API code? Is it possible to do it manually? Do you have any opinions on that? Oh, it's always possible to do things manually if you have the time, which is always kind of the challenge. Yeah. So I, I kind of want to address a couple of things here. So, you know, um, I think we talked about the challenges of shifting left or right, kind of expanding our security into the left uh, to steal from Mario, who made a nice comment about expand left um, a little later on. But um, the reason I think that developers and business teams don't adopt security is we make it very hard and we create these bottlenecks and roadblocks for them. So as we think forward, so and I'll kind of, you know, as I think about this, I think of the Tim's question about, hey, as a BA, like, what do we do? How do we think about security in the design process? This is something that we always talk about every time I come in, whether it's, you know, API security or any kind of security in the design process, especially in an, in an agile framework, we're doing increment planning where we're looking at all of our features and we're outlining our features, right? Uh, putting it with all of our business logic and what do we need to build out in the app? That's the time where we should be having conversations either with somebody from the security team to say, hey, you're building this API, it's going, right? It's part of Coinbase as the example and it's gonna right, allow you to sell your uh, cryptocurrency and exchange it. Well, we'd say, hey, there's some security requirements that need to be part of this around authentication and authorization, and we don't want people to be able to abuse it. So that gives those business teams the ability to start saying, oh, well, what does that mean? How do we plan that? So, you know, some of the things um, that we use to address those types of things are one, embed a security professional, which does not scale well, because we only have so many and there's way yeah. more business features coming out that we have security people. The other was through training. Right. So yeah. if we look at something like AppySec University, we should say, hey, inside of our enterprise, in each of our business teams, we have a designated security champion. We need them to understand how to secure their APIs. What is our um, enterprise pattern for securing APIs? All those things. So so, so using something like that, um, you know, and then when it comes to man, tools, um, I think we're seeing some new emerging tools around API security because the way we've done it in the past is test on the right, right? Use yeah. tools for um, penetration testing. So use something like Burp Suite to right run our APIs through it, and then our penetration testers are going to you know try to write really smart attacks to say test for you know all these different types of vulnerabilities we would test for using a dynamic scanning tool which has been effective to a degree, right? I don't think we've seen it really solve the problem that a great, you know, dynamic scanning tool can solve the problem for us. So, yeah. you know, that's where I think we're seeing things like AppySec and other vendors coming into the market and saying, oh, well, how do we start to generate 
specific tests crafted for specific vulnerabilities around APIs so that we can test them. Uh, well, in the, in, in, yeah, in, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead, Aaron. I was just going to say, in, in terms of the manual, um, it's just manual code review. So yeah. as a security professional, we need to make sure that, you know, because I was, you know, we're here, we're talking about developers need to be trained, developers need to be trained, right, on security. And if security developers just do security, they would do so much better. Well, yeah. um, my, there, there's a flip side to that coin. As somebody who's focused on security every single day, the most important thing um, that I think I can learn to be better at my job is how the software is made and how to develop software. Yeah. So if my job is to assess security of an API, it's not just about understanding the design and how it's deployed and how to test it. But if I were to open up that code and look at it, could I tell you that's an API just by looking at the code to say, yeah. oh, okay, I know that in Java Spring, I'm going to have methods with annotations that are clearly defined, right? And that's going to go in, you know, to this uh, part of the code, right? So it'll go into your controller. So I'll be like, oh, I know that the controllers are where the routes are defined. So let's go find all the controller files and just look to see what APIs are in there. And yeah, what are the inputs? I, what are the outputs? So, so we have to learn that if we're going to do the manual piece. And absolutely. And, and I asked uh, Christine to throw this up. I'll talk about this slide here in just a sec. But, um, you know, again, we're hearing this common theme of testing, right? Shifting left means, you know, validating, vetting, you know, um, analyzing the code that we're creating. There was a there's a comment here from Mario, right? Another problem I see developers are usually junior people lack the experience with security. Right. And um, a lot of what we do here in, in AppySecQ, we we do our courses, we analyze things. Uh, we analyzed I don't know, 50 plus different breaches that took place and tried to look for the common patterns here. And then this is what we found, right? The number one issue was rate limiting, right? And whenever, and, and we kind of concluded that, you know, whenever we see a million records being harvested or 10 million or 100 million, it kind of suggests, right? There's some sort of volumetric attack that's just not being detected or blocked, right? So call that rate limiting or whatever you want to call it. Um, but that's not really, you know, you might conclude this is the number one issue we got to solve, right? And I, I think it's the wrong conclusion. Um, it frankly just reveals the the limitations of, of using kind of brute force, you know, let's just rate limit or, you know, limit the number of requests because attackers are clever and they know how to bypass that and so forth. And it turns out the next three items, which correspond to OWASP 1, 2, and 3, are actually the primary cause of probably 80, 90% of the breaches that, that we've, we were able to, to analyze. And what are we talking about? Broken authorization. Can, can Dave access Aaron's records? Right, that kind of thing. Um, broken auth. Are we leaving the door unlocked? I'm not even talking about like sophisticated, you know, credential stuffing or brute forcing. Like, like so many APIs have the door left unlocked and and broken uh, or an excess data exposure are we returning too much data or is there sensitive values in here and, and i think to to mario's um point like um if we can elevate that awareness for for the engineers who are creating the apis to understand these are the primary attack vectors i mean there are obviously hundreds of others right but um that education piece i think you pointed it to to it, Aaron, is, is actually really critical. It's one of the reasons why, why AppySec University um, exists here. Um, Dave, I'm gonna ask you if you can try to share your desktop. Um, there's a little uh, kind of monitor button down there at the bottom, because yeah. hopefully it'll work, because uh, we have something super cool that we'd like to show you here. So at, at, at AppySec U, we've gone beyond creating courses and conferences and webinars and workshops, and we're actually now offering tooling um, so I'm really crossing fingers because Dave and team have built something super cool that you all can can try today, right? Aaron talked about the need for automation and, and building tooling into the CI/CD pipeline. And so, Dave, is it is it giving you any luck here to, to be able to share your desktop? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, I'll give a little primer on on the tool and, and what we learned from the market and what we heard from talking to all of the students and AppySec University. There are a couple of different sentiments. API security is hard, full stop. People have said that. People don't know where to start 
necessarily. And there aren't any magic bullets in the market. You can't just buy a tool and have API security. It's, it's not, um, there aren't many magic bullets in the world and in the way it works. Now, because it's hard, doing nothing about it is probably still the wrong answer. And so what we thought was we'd give the community a really easy way to get some coverage on their APIs. And today we're, we're starting with a community of GitHub users. So it's GitHub actions based. And later, I think we're going to try maybe the polling capability in this new um, webinar software to go ask you, what should our next technology be? Um, but at the end of the day, when you think about what Aaron was talking about, making it easy to go test your APIs and eliminating things that probably need to be done every time you release, so check for authentication, it probably doesn't serve you well to pay somebody to spend the time to do it on every single release. If you release once a day, if you release five times a day, if you release once a month, even still that time adds up and you need somebody to go do it. And so instead, what you can do is you can implement tools that chip away at the manual effort that you need to, to sync into every release. And so I'll share my screen right here. I think we would do best with my entire screen. So let's see, share. Let me know. Oh, we'll get um, oh, infinite. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Infinite uh, uh, mirror there. Okay. So this is called AppySec Scan for CI/CD. Today it works super well in GitHub Actions, and we're looking, like I said, for the next technology to um, to bring to the community and. The way that you implement is quite simple. If you're familiar with the GitHub Actions, you probably can just add this to an existing GitHub Action. You can first go to this web page, which I have here, and request a token. And so you just provide name, email, and you know company. This information will, if I hit register, it'll issue you a token that'll allow you to use this. Now, what are some things that are notable about AppySec scan CICD. There's no external dependency required. So in other cases, like if you look at other testing tools, you might have to connect to a SaaS backend. This is not that. This all happens contained in your GitHub environment in this case. And so there's no concern about sending your data out elsewhere, somebody else getting your Swagger OAS file, your um, documentation for your APIs all of the scanning happens within your environment. So we thought that was one interesting piece. The second piece is it runs with very little configuration. I'll go to the um, GitHub page, which has a little bit more information on um, how to set it up. Yeah. It's actually linked and lower on that page. Okay. Oh, awesome. So okay. if you bit. are navigating there, yeah, there, visit the GitHub. There you go. Perfect. So we'll go here. This is what it looks like. It's Abby Sex Scan GitHub Action. And I have a repo that's ready. It's a commonly used repo for all sorts of API security testing. And I'm going to add the Abby Sex Scan for CI CD. And all I need to do is I'm going to copy this text. And uh, the, the app is called Crappy, if you're familiar with it. And I'm going to go over here and this is um, my workflow in the crappy GitHub repo. I'm going to add this and provide some information. So over here, I have a URL because what AppySec Scan does is it calls your live API. So you've probably seen spec analysis. You've probably seen other static tools. This needs a live environment that's running in order to test this API for you. So you need to provide the URL. This one is hosted here at crappy.appysec.ai. You want to provide an open API specification. So this happens to be the path in this directory for where the documentation lives. And last, you need to provide that token. So you guys probably thinking, 
Dave, we're going to steal your token right now. No <laughs> way. We don't store plain text secrets here. And so um, this, this actually leverages GitHub secrets in order to do so. And so um, just a couple quick Git commands, like oh, if I could type quickly. OK, great. So this is the single change. I'll commit this. Um, I'll call it add new pen test workflow. Great. There's a question here, Dave, sorry to interrupt, from Luca. What is the token used for if it's running in our environment? The token's just used for, um, because we th this is a tool that calls APIs and it does injection attacks and things like that. We want to validate that we're not distributing this to uh, at least unknown folks. And so this just allows you to use the tool um, we want to make sure that we're safely distributing it like under a license that you agree to not use this for malicious purposes and things like that. And so um, that's the, part of the uh, part of the registration process, if you will. That's right. And, yeah, and quick question here, Dave, maybe a clarification. It's it's running from a GitHub action. So it's running from public GitHub against right. the public API. So. So that's right. Although um, you could, uh, there's a note in here, I think, about private runners. Maybe it's not here on this page, but if if you're using GitHub Actions, there's public runners, which just run in GitHub. You can also run private runners that actually run in your cloud, in your on-premises. You just have to set that up a little separately. But but today, yes, we're running from public GitHub. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But that would be their their internal environment if they have github enterprise or github SaaS and they've deployed public runners or yeah. internal runners already yep. internal runners yeah yep. and and dave I, i'm sure i bet you're gonna go there from vioma what kind of vulnerabilities are reported by this so i'm sure you're gonna you're gonna show us yeah absolutely okay so this is what happens when you push and and actually let me describe this just a little bit more so uh, if you're not familiar with github actions you define when the action runs, this one happens to run on push, which I just did, to the main branch. And so that happened, this automatically picks up and runs the tests. And so for any future, now that this code or this definition is here in GitHub Actions, this will continue to run every time somebody uh, pushes to, uh, uh, to your GitHub um, repo. And so this one is the API pen test job, succeeded one minute ago, it took 23 seconds to run, so pretty quick, not a lot of time waiting, spent waiting. And this is the stage that is most interesting. So what it did was it first parsed the specification. And that's important because we need to know what the API does, what tests to run. And then it ran live requests against the API. And it returns the results here. The ones that are interesting, the most interesting are the errored results. And so you can see there's some SSL tests that were ran, no certificate was found, no HTTP security, uh, strict security uh, header it was, was found there. And so you, know, you can click links and learn more about these. One of the most interesting things and what I feel is the most valuable for this one is the authentication checks. So when you call an endpoint, is it authenticated? Is it protected? This one happens to be the signup one. It's enforced, but it's not documented, right? So it's it's telling you that your docs are lacking the definition for this particular endpoint. Um, there's another one here that I found that was, uh, there are some that are intentionally left open, like this one happens to be a login endpoint. So, you know, this is accessible to all to go try to log in. We do, looking at headers, we do looking at payloads and we try to inject into these. And so these are some basic categories that can uncover problems. And by the way, if you look and you scroll all the way down to the bottom of this, it's some, I don't know, 800 lines of uh, tests that were written and, and a lot of them passed, no injection reflections found in the responses or all of these. And, and the brunt of the issues are gonna be found towards the top of this list. But um, what it does is it, it helps you have some API testing, very low effort, very easy to integrate without external dependencies, without needing to purchase a tool. Um, and we're happy to help you set this up if you have problems. And so if you, if you want to reach out to us, reach out to me or Dan or on AppySec University, 
we can help you, guide you, get a call, you know, look at your technology, see if we can get something up and running. But at the end of the day, you know, we saw end to end where we started here, we added this definition, which is customizable, get your DevOps engineer, get your, uh, your CI expert who can help you customize this to your environment, because maybe they're adding this job um, instead of, you know, sort of uh, just creating a brand net new action. So my ask for you, two asks, I think we're going to try to do a poll here that I'm going to go, once I stop sharing screen, I'll go tee that up once we, as we keep talking, but then two, give it a try because it's free. There's not a lot of um, effort required and, you know, not a lot of risk here. Tell us what you think about the results. Tell us what categories you think we should be adding next. And we'll, we'll definitely have a conversation and, and figure out, you know, how we can better serve the community with this free tool. So, um, yeah. Um, really super cool. This is my first time seeing it, Dave. Um, and, and it's, it's, uh, really amazing. Um, so kudos to you and the team for, for putting this together. Um, does look extremely easy to use, but, um, we, we would love everyone here on, on the call to give it a try and, and give us your, give us your feedback. Um, I did notice there was a comment here from Vioma or question. How do you ensure that API security testing or any security testing does not slow down the DevOps pipeline uh, because that would be a common concern for for developers. I think you've you've shown here this doesn't need to be something that's adding you know hours or days or or any significant amount of time here, right? And this is frankly the the beauty of of automation, right? Like you know if you think about the alternative, right? Doing it by hand. It's just, you know, it's it's going to be infinitely more time consuming, but also it's just simply not going to keep pace with, with yeah. all those pushes to prod. Yeah, sometimes people try to make unnatural leaps. And what I mean by that is they go from no testing to we're going to gate the pipeline. That is a huge, huge chasm to cross to go from <laughs> no testing to say we're going to put something that's going to gatekeep you from production. There, there are often intermediate steps. And those intermediate steps could look like run asynchronously. Don't depend on the success of this step in order to proceed with the pipeline. Or maybe you could run um, and you could limit, uh, I don't know, the, the environments where you're testing. So maybe you're running in dev environments, lower environments that don't have such a strong dependency on getting code out to production when it's built. It often gets dropped in a testing environment and then testing is performed manually, functional testing, security testing, and then it proceeds. So I think it's just understanding at what point you want to do this test and you know what is the actual impact to the process and is there a way that we can do a zero impact implementation, which is often the no op, no block, you know, let's just get re uh, results. Like I think there's a lot of middle ground there between the, you know, just getting started and we're, we're gonna really have some gates to get to production. Well, um, Dave, I'll let you uh, go create that poll because I'm kind of curious to see what uh, what kind of results we get out of it. But but Aaron, flipping to, to you, like what you've seen here, I mean, I don't need you to weigh in on the goodness of, of the tool, but is this the direction that you think we all need to be moving in? Yeah, it, it certainly gets us um, in that direction. Um, I, I will say the one thing I liked when Dave told me, hey, this is a GitHub action. To me, like, and this is where I recommend security right? professionals really learn development because a GitHub action on the back end is usually a container um, and you've published it. And it's because it's available for GitHub to use, it's available to anyone. So if we kind of want to go in and look at the secret sauce behind it, right, so to speak, that's right, we can see how that runs inside the container. It also means that if I don't use GitHub, Dave, you guys have published an action in GitHub using the container with the inputs and outputs, I could translate that into a code fresh or a Jenkins pipeline myself. So if I wanted to take the, the onus, right, I, I could do that inside of my organization and still get some of this benefit if we're not a GitHub enterprise user um, or something like that. So, so I really like that. Um, and the other part I think that we, that, that I like as well is that it's it's a low bar, right? So it you don't have to go and buy something, 
you can start to see what the results look like. You know, as Dave said, we don't want to break the builds right away. A lot of times we just need some information. We need to see, are there things we should be concerned about? How do we start to handle these? How do we start to make them better? So um, for sure, this is moving in, in the right direction for us because now we can start testing earlier with uh, like a, a, we had a lower barrier to entry because those are the yeah. things that get in our way a lot. Um, and I see a couple of questions here, Dave. Um, all right, there's the poll. Fantastic. Um, is, the, is there a recording here? Yeah, absolutely. This whole session is recorded. We will be sharing that later. Um, a suggestion to make a video um, on YouTube. Definitely a great idea, Manuel. Let's, yeah, we'll definitely follow that and we can embed it on the page as well. Just kind of, you know, Dave, uh, if you can give us a tour uh, and how to use it and install it and so forth, I think that would be be super helpful. Um, I think from Mohamedou, hey, Mohamedou, how are you? Um, aside from GitHub, this tool can be integrated into GitLab Jenkins, correct? Um, not yet, um, but I think that's what Dave is is hoping to get some some responses here. So, um, all right, hopefully everyone can click on the polls tab and fill that out. And yeah, there's Dave's uh, um, uh, email address. So if you've got any questions or feedback, this is a brand new product. Um, we we'll call it a version one. Maybe it's, maybe it's, you know, um, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, just, just barely there, but there's so much more that I think Dave's got in mind for this product and where he wants to go with it. But your feedback is, is super, uh, super instrumental there. Um, Christine, can you throw up uh, slide seven, please? Because uh, we're running out of time here. Um, this has been a super fun session. I appreciate all your your patience um, as we've had to deal with some of the the, the technical um, snags here. But I do want to um, invite you here to AppySecCon. This is our conference that's coming up in three weeks from now. It's all free. It's all virtual. If time zones are tricky, it's also all recorded. So uh, you can come back and watch any of the sessions that you like. Right? We have truly um, amazing speakers here. Confidence, Corey, Gabby, Brenton, Jason Haddix, uh, just amazing um, API, uh, super team, frankly. Uh, and so highly in, highly recommend you come join us here for, for AppySecCon. Uh, it says over 3,500 registered. It's actually um, getting darn near 6,000 at this point. So um, just kind of terrified at uh, <laughs> making sure all the logistics go smoothly for that. Um, but you know, it's going to be a fantastic event. And um, if you don't mind going to the last slide here, Christine, um, I just want to say thank you to, to Aaron and to Dave. Um, it is, uh, it's been a real pleasure having you here on, on the, on the call. Um, Christine, can you pop to the next slide, please? Uh, we have the, we're going to throw up these, uh, these QR codes. So if you didn't catch any of those links here, or if you'd like copies of these slides, you've got my email address right there. So please just uh, shoot me a note um, and, uh, and we'll take care of it. But there you've got the link to AppySecCon, um, the, the product that Dave just demoed for you, AppySec Scan for CICD. And then we have uh, this, this workshop series. Uh, and basically what that is, is I do a lot of sessions. These are one hour educational talks. I do them for like OWASP communities or ISC squared or you know, Cloud Security Alliance chapters, or for um, private organizations. So if you want to raise awareness about API security in your company, uh, then request a workshop. These are free. There's no cost. There's no sales pitch. It's just really good quality um, education and content. So if that sounds interesting to you. Please um, take a picture of that or or hit up uh, hit me up um, with an email, and we can we can get you taken care of here. Um, and with that, yep, we got all of the typical, is this recorded questions? Yep, absolutely. Um, looks like hopefully Dave, you got some good feedback on the, uh, on your, on your poll here. Yeah. Um, I'm not clicking on it. I don't want to tamper with the data, but does <laughs> you seeing results already? Yep. So it looks like the front runners are the front runner is GitLab at 20 votes. We've got Azure pipeline DevOps, Azure DevOps at 16 and Jenkins at 13. So um, I, I think that we have some good um, data to go off of here. And I, I also want to say thank you, everyone, for joining. We're really happy SecU is, is only made by the community, by all of you who participate in these webinars, who take the courses. And it, it makes us so happy that 
you know, we have such an engaged community that is interested in learning and, and raising the bar for everyone in API security. So really, really appreciate it. Thank you for joining all over the world. Yeah, it's it's a it's our it's our pleasure to 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 be be able to deliver all this great content. It's it's thanks to people like Aaron, who you know share your generous time, Dave, who build these awesome products, Corey, and all of our instructors. So um, yeah, it's been it's been a labor of love and and a, a real pleasure to to be able to do this. Aaron, thanks so much for being here. I uh, really enjoyed the conversation. Hopefully, we can twist your arm and and bring you back one day. Yeah, hopefully we can we can do this again. Um, Thank you, Dan, for the invite. I really do appreciate that. And right, Dave and, and the whole team right over there at uh, AppySec University. It's been uh, great to be on the call. It's so exciting to see so many people joined as well. So awesome to see, you know, all, all over the world, this huge community come in to learn and ask questions. So it's great yeah. to see, like, amazing interaction uh, from the audience. So yeah, yeah thank no, you, everyone. And thanks to the audience. Um, it's always it's always fun to have you all here. So thanks for joining us. That's enough with all the thank yous. We'll wrap up here. Look out for um, some follow up emails. Give that give Epi Six Scan a try. Let Dave know what you think of it. Um, give us your feedback. Uh, there's definitely going to be some rough edges. So let us know what they are, what we can do to make it better, and we'll see you all around. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks all. See ya.